Okay, well, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. So, um, obviously, we're only a week away now from the the start of COP COP twenty six, um, and it's the first time the UK has hosted. I have to say, probably the last time the UK will host COP. Um, so, um, we've we've got this huge opportunity to influence the global climate agenda in our own country, which we've never had before. Um, this will be my fourth COP, so. I session because I've, I've got experience and also I'm the uh, what's called the global rapporteur for for the interparliamentary union which is the organization for for all the global parliaments and uh, and they choose a parliamentarian from the host nation to effectively pull together the voice of the parliament and keep that block. But that's what i'm currently quite busy with at the moment and then i'm going to cop on the 3rd of November. So if any of you are around between the 4th and the 11th of November, I'm also a cop, so um, you can always email me. And we can try and meet up, or if you've got an event, I can try and come to it. Um, and today really is is about how we can link, because COP's a usually complex thing. You know, there are, there are 30,000 people who are accredited and probably the same again who aren't, which make up the sort of COP family. And, um, it, and it's really difficult to know if you've never been before how to engage in it. So um, I'm, I'll probably maybe just say a little bit about that rather than about the, the global agreements or the rest of it, which you can read about in the newspapers. Um, so the, the, the COP is two zones which you need to be accredited for, the green zone and the blue zone. It's fairly unlikely that you'll be accredited to the blue zone unless you've got a, a strong link to either um, a negotiating country uh, or um, or, or an NGO that, that's accredited, um, and maybe some of you uh, have that, which is great, and then you'll have more direct access to negotiate, because so that's where negotiators live and talk and discuss the um, agreement. And then there's the green zone, which is the official fringe, if you like, and, and, there, and there are different theme days, and those are now available on the COP website. Um, and uh, you can go, and there are themed events in the green zone, but there is also a huge amount of Outside those zones, particularly organised um, either by the NGO sector, by the activist groups, or by the business sector. So, depending on how you want to engage with those areas quite strongly, you can get. Alex, Alex, sorry, can I just ask you, can you come in a bit closer to your mic? Only because yeah. we're recording this and this is important stuff. So, that, that would be great. Thank you. Like my head's very big now, if I could be too close. Don't anyway. worry. <laughs> uh, so um, there's no, I'm afraid there's no for, um, for the, the for, for changes outside the zones. And so you, you, you generally can get a feel for it once you're in Glasgow. I mean, the first day, I would say, or the first half day, if you haven't got anything in your diary and you're in Glasgow, it's, it's just, um, there, are, there are some, you know, if you do some research on Glasgow, there are some places where there are going to be um, major activity which aren't in the zone. Um, so if you haven't got accreditation, I, I hang around the centre of Glasgow, people will give you leaflets, people will talk to you. It'll be very, it becomes quite obvious what's happening and where, um, in, particularly in the uh, in the business space. If, and, if, uh, Alex, I'm going to stop you again. I'm really right. sorry. It's but very get my headset. Yeah, Should would you? Headset. I think yeah, that would okay. be a really, really good idea. Thank you. Sorry about this, folks. Um, the wonders of Zoom and microphones that are inbuilt and microphones on headsets. I know we all prefer not to wear headsets, but sometimes I think it is easier. So, or at least the better quality of sound. So let's see if that helps. Okay, how's that? Is that a lot better? Sounds a lot better with first words, definitely. Thank you. Okay. You're also a lot louder, so I'm going to turn oh. the volume down at my end. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so, so, yes, yeah, so, so in the activity there's a lot of feedback from somebody now. Okay, great. Um, so, in, in the activist space, there, there are, there'll, be a, there'll be a big fringe, and in the business space, what, what I'd say is, um, if you're in a particular sector, so you're involved in, say, transport 
or you're involved in um, uh, environmental products or you're involved in um, uh, health, there, there will be some health events and, or, or whatever it is, education, there'll be big, and again, that obviously crosses across the two, two different areas. There'll be a lot of activity. But what I do is maybe um, email industry associations, ask them what they're doing, uh, or, or individual large um, businesses and see if, if they've got events. And they probably will have, um, certainly, they might have roundtables, they might not invite you, but they'll certainly have receptions, uh, some of these industry associations and other events which are outside the zones. Because uh, a lot of them, because yeah, there's an additional layer of cost. If you have, if you want to have an event in the green zone, which you can if you're a private company, a one you have to pay for the green zone, which is quite expensive. You have to pay for the for the accreditation, and three you have to pay for the event. So a lot of them will just book an, um, somewhere in Glasgow uh, and um, have events. So I know I know, for instance, the big company, um, SSE, etc. Have all got they've all either booked or booked booked some venues. And and they've got events on, so so you know so um, do a little bit of that work before you arrive if you want to engage in the business space. Um, and then before I introduce the speakers, because I know that we've got three minutes till till we need to get into the individual social enterprises. Um, the 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 reality of copies, it's like it's like Glastonbury for the climate. So when you're just travelling round in the morning or in the evening on public transport and there's the subway system in Glasgow and all the rest of it you don't know who you're going to be sitting next to um it is quite likely we sat next to a negotiator from a country and everybody's having conversations so don't don't do what you do on the underground if you're from London and never to talk to anybody you utilize the opportunity wherever you're sat wherever you're going uh, if they've got a pass on to have a conversation with somebody um because because the negotiator Chairs aren't famous people, you know, it's not Kerry or, you know, somebody like that. We're talking about um, effectively civil servants who, who are specialist negotiators uh, every year and then do all the work between the copper. There's also another copper and biodiversity, it's the same people. And they just go on the public transport like you and me. And so it, you can get a real feel and have a real somebody right at the centre of the of this um, just, just as you go. And people are quite open. Not like a secret, people will discuss quite openly what's going on, what's happening, where the inflection points are. The other thing I'd say is there's a big day on the 11th for cities and regions. So for social enterprises, the big influence point in terms of opportunity is with all the big local authorities in the UK are going to be there. Um, the mayors are all going to be there. Obviously, international, you know, European and, and, and US actually mayors and governors etc are going to be uh, around that time so again which is easier to get and if you've got connections to one of the big ngos they might be able to credit you although it's coming now to the end of that quickly if you want to get credited because they are i understand nearly full the um, in terms of the number of people they can let in um the real good networking opportunities on that day if you can get into the cities and regions um, events uh, once you're in actually it's really you know it's really easy to get into events and have and have conversations with with you know metro mayors or city leaders um, and ones from ones from around the world so um, that's a good day to go if if that's the sort of the sort of point that you want to influence if you don't want to influence at government or intergovernmental level then uh, the eleventh is a really good day to go. That's my last day as well. So uh, I'm going to try and go because that's when I first went to COP. That was in Paris in 2015. That was the the, the huge COP, best COP we've ever had. Who've got? Who I know somebody's been to every single COP, and that's what they say. And the, the city and regions pavilion and the events put on by Anne Hidalgo, who's the mayor of Paris, were exemplary. And you really felt you were part of the process. And it's just you know the, the lead for five on these city councils, so not a big global player or anything. And you really felt that you were part of that process. So I'm hoping that we can get some of that in Glasgow. So anyway, I've probably spoke enough uh, on that. And and so um, I think it's a good time to move on and introduce our uh, three speakers. And I'm really interested to hear what they have to say, because um, actually we're all swimming in the unknown a little bit. And, I, uh, and I'm, I'm really interested to see what individual social enterprises um, have got uh, their perspective, what they think the opportunities are. So we've got um, Pranav Chopra from Nemi Tees, 
Harry Wright from Bright Tide and uh, Cressa Wesling for Elvis and Cressa. Um, and I'd like an explanation of what the Elvis is in Elvis and Cressa. I know. So um, maybe we'll start with Pranav. Pranav, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Social Enterprise, for having me here today, actually. Um, it's a true privilege. And uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Pranav Chopra, founder of Nemi Teas. Um, so to give you all a quick background on who we are and what we do, Nemi Teas is a London-based specialist tea company and a registered social enterprise. We sell our tea products at both retail and wholesale level across the UK and Europe. We mostly work with large corporates like the uh, like PwC, Ernst & Young, SAP and the like, offering our teas in their boardrooms, meeting rooms and cafe areas. We also supply our teas to over 300 cafes, delis and other independent stores across the country. Through our work, we actually provide training and employment to refugees living in Greater London to help them overcome two major hurdles uh, we believe that they face in breaking into the UK workforce. That's the lack of local work experience and access to a local referee. We're working with currently uh, working with local charity partners uh, called Groundwork London and the Hotel School to recruit and train refugees across our supply chain in roles such as the blending, the packing of the teas, as well as hosting external events. Post the training program, we currently place our trained staff members into full-time jobs with one of our employment partners, like the Compass Group and the Hotel School itself. Lastly, the areas of climate change, sustainability, and the environmental impact have been a huge focus for us since day one at NAMI Teas. Taking that into consideration, all our tea bags are 100% plastic free and compostable. They're actually made of a mesh filter from 100% non-GMO sugarcane material. Even the string is attached to the tea bag, not via typical glue, but actually contains, which contains plastic material, but via ultrasound. Also, um, all our external packaging is biodegradable and have, we've used a technology called NatureFlex, which uses materials made from wood pulp. So I guess just keeping our business model in mind and the environmental focus that we have, um, I feel there are three ways social enterprises like ours can really aim to actively influence other organizations, especially large corporates that are now facing up to their responsibilities in tackling climate change. Firstly, I think it's about raising the possible, you know, showing that it is viable to do business more sustainably, providing inspiration for others, and offering up new models that can be copied and replicated. You know, next, I think it's about raising the desirable, really building the appeal of system, sustainable businesses, uh, business models, and for consumers, employees, and as well as investors, really. Um, lastly, I feel it's about raising the acceptable. You know, it's, it's time now to change the parameters of what is generally considered acceptable or not or where it comes to sustainability and inclusiveness. And I guess just one more point, really. Businesses are much more than the internal operations. In fact, a significant proportion of businesses' social and environmental impact is currently incurred by its supplier base. I guess more commonly refers to as stage three emissions. So if businesses want to drive change, uh, a genuine change within their social value policies, they really need to look towards their supplier base. And this is where I feel there is an untapped opportunity for corporations and social enterprises to work together to achieve climate goals. So I hope I've been able to highlight the hu huge opportunity that lies uh, ahead for social enterprises like ours to really lead on this agenda, inspire others and demonstrate the radical alternatives. So thank you so much. And hopefully that will that give you a better insight of what social enterprises can do going forward. So much, Pranav, that was that was really interesting overview of what of what you guys do. Um, uh, we've got Harry next. So Harry over to you. We're gonna take the three the three speakers then we'll come back for questions and I'll repeat my question. Press it because Chris is only just <laughs> so Harry. 
Thank you, Alex. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the role in which social enterprises can play in developing more effective policies for a climate smart future and also helping the private sector transition to a more just, equitable and sustainable future. So by way of introduction, my name is Harry Wright and I'm the CEO and founder of the environmental social enterprise Bright Tide. And we work with private sector companies to educate, empower and engage um, organisations and their employees around um, building knowledge and understanding uh, with climate change and biodiversity. So the, the timing of this meeting today cannot be understated or underplayed. And with COP26 just around the corner and the enormity of the urgent issues that we face due to the climate change and biodiversity crisis, it is perhaps the greatest challenge of our time. And with this challenge, this mighty huge challenge, I believe that social enterprises can help us transition to a safer future. And my own social enterprise is working in these following areas, along with many other social enterprises out there in the sector. So firstly, I think the social enterprises can help improve sustainability and transparency within corporate supply chains. As Pranav has mentioned, it's vitally important that companies improve their supply chains in order to reduce their own carbon emissions relating to scope three emissions in line with the science-based targets, but also to meet the SDGs. And the great thing is social enterprises can help us with this from sustainable tea to compostable packaging, beer, which is reducing food waste or saving endangered species. There are hundreds, if not thousands of incredible social enterprises that can fit into your global value chain today and replace polluting or unsustainable practices that are only damaging your business and customers. And you can make that change today. It's, it's really that simple. Moreover, if companies improve their social procurement process, it's a great way to demonstrate their social value in line with the Social Value Act and to meet commitments to the SDGs and other sustainability reporting requirements. Secondly, I believe that social enterprises can play an important role in educating, engaging and advising companies and their employees around the regulatory transition and supply chain risks that both climate change and biodiversity loss pose to companies. Education around climate change is so important and Client Earth recently reported that the overwhelming majority of the UK's top listed companies are failing to meet meaningful disclosed climate related risks, impacts and financial implications. And given that many companies are increasingly making public net zero commitments, this widespread failure not only highlights possible greenwashing, but also puts some firms in breach of existing UK laws. And the laws and regulation are changing very quickly in this area, from the TCFD, the TCND, and the CMA, which has recently announced it's cracking down on greenwashing with its Green Claims Code. Therefore, social enterprises can play that vital role in facilitating educational and training sessions to not only help companies understand these targets, but also to understand the implications if they do not meet them. This is also important because there are not only huge financial risks involved here, there are massive reputational risks. And with a changing demographic and workforce that cares very much about climate change and social justice issues, companies need to get their house in order today if they want to retain and attract a talented and diverse workforce for tomorrow. There's also a vital role that social enterprises can play in companies understand the value of nature and answer such questions like, what is biodiversity? What is natural capital? And why should I, as an organization, care about the natural world? And thirdly, social enterprises can play a pivotal role in bridging the huge funding gap that is required to finance nature-based solutions to climate change and fund solutions to also enhance and restore biodiversity in the UK. As you know, the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries on earth and only 53% of our biodiversity remains. Moreover, the world is facing an 8.1 trillion financing gap into nature to help combat the climate crisis and ecological breakdown. And according to a new UN report that warns that annual investments into nature's solutions has to increase fourfold by 2050. You see, nature is our great solution to climate change. But one of the gaps in our current knowledge is finding the scalable and investment ready nature based solutions that companies can invest into. And again, that is where social enterprises can come in, because there are already many social entrepreneurs that are working in this incredible space but do not have the support, access to finance or promotion that they need in order to fully scale and grow. And as I mentioned, my own social enterprise is trying to answer many of these questions, which I propose today. 
and we work with organizations to educate, empower and engage organizations to build knowledge, understanding and expertise around climate change and biodiversity. And as a social enterprise, we donate 50% of our profits to a conservation charity, which is working to protect critically endangered species around the world, such as the Kakapo, the Pangolin and the Ai. In essence, what I love about social enterprise is that our primary objective is not only to make a commercial profit, but it is all around creating social purpose and social impact. And if we can work with the private sector to get them to embed social purpose within their own organizations and to take concrete, meaningful and impactful action against climate change and biodiversity loss. And I truly believe we have half a chance in turning the tide on some very difficult times to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Harry. And, and last, uh, by no means least, and I, and I think Cressa uh, joined after asked the question, but Cressa Wesling from Elvis and Cressa, and I, I really like uh, an explanation of, of, of the name, because the Cressa bit's obvious, but the Elvis is, isn't. So Elvis' partner called Elvis, which you might have, it'd be quite it'd be really interesting to know why it's called Elvis and Cressa. Anyway, over to you. Um, yes, my business partner is called Elvis. Well, he actually technically isn't called Elvis, but when I met him, he was dressed as Superman and introduced as Elvis. And we were living together for six months before I found out his name was James. So I think, <laughs> I think Elvis is very much his name. Yeah, James would be um, as good. James and Cressa wouldn't be as good. Would no. And I have to say, it's, um, it's definitely something that Googles well. And because Cressy is really tough to spell and everybody knows how to spell Elvis, it's, it's the right way for the brand to, to have evolved over time. People can definitely find us online. Um, this is a, a fantastic topic to be to to be discussing, particularly in the build up towards. Um, I, I let's not even talk about COP. Let's talk about the the build up to climate catastrophe and biodiversity catastrophe, and basically no viable planet for anybody's grandchildren to be living on. And I think social enterprises, as the other speakers have mentioned are poised to tackle this challenge because this is what we do. We look at incredibly difficult, intractable system, messy problems, and we design businesses specifically to solve them. We don't bring our businesses in line with the idea of mitigating climate change over time. We tackle it head on. And I think that this is the kind of the social entrepreneurial thinking um, and the way teams can be galvanized, the way communities can be galvanized is all in the social enterprise wheelhouse. So I firmly believe that if there is a business movement that can really get to grips with things as complicated as climate change and biodiversity loss, it is this business community and this business movement. And also there's a lot of us, you know, we're not talking about 400 businesses or a thousand businesses. We were talking about tens of thousands of businesses in the UK and millions of businesses worldwide where the MO is that the world isn't good enough and the world can be better. And how are we going to make that happen while, while providing viable livelihoods? You know, there's nothing wrong with the idea of a business and, and paying people lots of lovely salaries, but we know how to tackle these problems. You know, Alison Cressy, what do we, what do we do? We started in 2005. We started by seeing the problem of London's decommissioned fire hose and realizing that if we if we saved it, if we took it home, if we turned it into something wonderful that everyone could love, then we could give it a second dignified life as opposed to it just going directly to landfill. We also give 50% of the profits to the firefighters charity. Um, and then, you know, if you think about that being like one little tiny simple mission that we started the business with, that quickly leaches into everything else. And I think this is also why I really love the social enterprise movement and why I think it's well poised to solve these challenges because I, I know very few social entrepreneurs that have started with one simple mission and stuck with that, okay? We're all very good at multitasking. And I think the, 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 the way you can express the, this the best is that we're always trying to achieve multiple positive objectives. So we're not just trying to make money, we're trying to solve problems. We're trying to think about the method, the, the, everything that a company might do and how that can be done better. So for us, that's, we don't just make the products from waste, we make the packaging ourselves also from waste. We run an apprenticeship program. Um, we run on renewable energy. 
we've just moved to a farm so that we can become net regenerative by 2030 so that we can sequester carbon into the soil directly ourselves so that we could build a wetland system to treat all of our own sewage uh, so that we could actually set up our own off-grid systems and be a net, net, net energy contributor to the grid. And yeah, why is a luxury handbags company doing those things? The reason it's doing those things is because we're social entrepreneurs before we're luxury entrepreneurs. Because actually the, the, nothing is more important than the planet or its people. And you can fit all of those objectives into any viable business model. So as long as you, I guess I've always had this idea that as long as you could make some money, you could just view that money as WD-40. And the rest of your time, or at least 50% of your time, should be focused on the big problems and how you can use your, your team and the skills that are there and the creativity that you have to tackle those problems as well. So when people say, oh, well, you have no, no business, it's like, what, what, what are you doing spending all this time talking about sewage? Well, I think sewage is incredibly important. And based on the Twitter memes that were happening last night, I think the vast majority of people in the UK think that sewage is quite important too, and that we shouldn't be letting our MPs off the hook. Mm -hmm. Those that voted to have sewage just go running free into the rivers and that private companies could have 30 years of positive mm -hmm. dividends without reinvesting in the infrastructure that should be protecting ecosystems and habitats. Um, you know, they allowed, they, they allowed and will continue to allow sewage to run into the rivers. And I don't think that that's anyone's, in anyone's interest, let alone the ecosystem that we're supported by, which is why as a statement piece for us, constructing a wetland system, a natural system to treat our own sewage was crucially important. So do, so I think this is also a, a group that's particularly good at saying, I might not be an expert in that but I can tackle that as well. And this is, this is what's really important is that a lot of people feel like the climate uh, crisis or the biodiversity crisis isn't their job because they're not a scientist. How many people on this call are in an enterprise that they're not an expert in, but they just care about so deeply that they couldn't walk away from that challenge? That's the, that's the level of commitment that the climate needs. And I think the other interesting thing is that when you open your sort of mind to the potential of your viable businesses and what they could also be doing, that has a huge impact on your wider community and on your teams. And that's where these things really, really start to spread like wildfire. You know, we have in our small community in North Kent, just by putting a wetland sewage treatment system in the landscape, we have attracted 10 of our farming neighbors to do the same thing instead of replacing old failed septic systems. Setting an example, a positive example, and also a joyful example when everything is pretty dark is very important too. So I, I um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be given this platform to talk about it. I'm not a climate expert. None of us are, I suppose, but we, as soon as you have a viable business model, my view is, is that you're capable and that means you're responsible. And it also means you can have a whole lot of fun doing the right thing. Thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. That was real, real good, really, really strategic um, uh, overview there, actually. Um, just about that expert thing. No, no one is an expert on all aspects of the climate because it's, it's as broad and as deep as, as any subject that we discuss on this planet. Um, and just full disclosure, I voted um, in favour of us um, making the water companies put all the sewage treatment plants in. So uh, I'm allowed to stay on the call on that basis. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm, I've got, we've got one question so far, so please do um, put your questions in. Uh, it's from Louisa Chalenti, but I'm going to ask a little one just to get us going, an easy one, and then we'll move into Louisa's quite, quite complex question and then hopefully other people will will um will uh, come in with questions as well so um just so the three of you because obviously this is a cop themed uh, event one are you going to cop and if you're if you are going to cop what what are your aims and what do you think you'll be doing at cop and two if you're not going to cop why are you not going 
um, and then we'll move on to Louise's question. So, um, so maybe we'll start with Harry, because you, you seem to be most directly related to COP that you might be actually be going. So. Yeah, thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to go uh, on the Saturday and, and Sunday, I think, which I think is the 7th and 8th of uh, November. And our aims really are to, uh, to network, so to meet um, other leaders in the space, to meet businesses, uh, to use it as a really good business development kind of event. And then on the Monday, we're traveling up to one of our sites in uh, Scotland, which is sort of past Inverness. We're, we're working on this big, huge restoration project. So it gives us an opportunity actually to see the peatland restoration work that we're doing as well. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll be a good, good two days. Okay, Pranav. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we won't be attending. Um, we're launching a new pro uh, project um, with with refugees, um, and yeah, so unfortunately, I won't be there. Presser. Um, I, and originally, I was not going to go, and now I'm going twice, which <laughs> seems really kind of wrong. Um, but it's actually because they, there are a few conversations specifically about the impact that, that fashion is having on the, on the environment. And I would say, or not having, um, and we have a, we have a huge issue in this sector where there's a, actually an amazing body of the, they're called the union of concerned researchers in fashion that are consistently publishing how mediocre it is when it comes to climate and yet how good it is at celebrating every little success that it makes. Um, and there needs to be people who are happy to, I, I suppose, be provocative and tell it like it is. And it's quite easy for me to do because we're in the industry and, we, and I know what it takes to run a social enterprise <laughs> that makes luxury goods. Um, and, and one that's you know committed to net zero and net regenerative. I, I think that's the reason I'm going is because otherwise it will be dominated by big, by big brands who are keen to celebrate how one tiny little element of one tiny little product is making a contribution. And we need to talk about a whole realignment of the industry, of the supply chain it relies on, of how poorly it pays its people um, and how much it overproduces. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you, I used to be in the Environmental Order Committee, we did an inquiry on fast fashion, and that really blew open the practices in the sector, particularly, I have to name companies who are really bad, Boohoo and ASOS, just just yeah. awful, in every in every way you could think of, including in terms of poor labour conditions, even here in the UK, in Leicester and East London. So, you know, absolutely everything they were terrible at, so, including trying to sell too many clothes to people who wouldn't wear them. Um, so um, on that note, I'm going to go I invite you to ask your question or questions, Louisa. Um, you, um, good morning to everyone and great to be in such good inspirational company. So um, I've spent most of my career supporting social enterprises and not least um, community energy uh, organisations. And it's been a real battle uh, for the last five years since there's been the decline uh, in funding and notwithstanding that I think all the research uh, globally um, and some of the good research that's still coming out of the UK shows us that countries that um, have high rates of social enterprise startups have the strongest uh, economic growth and resilient communities um, through the engagement that we've had um, uh, into government level, I still don't feel that the message is resounding with Treasury about the benefits um, that social enterprises bring. And here we are with our net zero strategy, setting out our roadmap for tackling climate change. And the role of social enterprises has been swept away again. Um, and I just wanted to ask whether uh, you feel that there's a, a strong enough campaign for myth busting um, around the social enterprise movement, not least that I think there's still um, a, a, a belief that um, social enterprises can't run their businesses um, and they're just small businesses and they're not having enough, enough impact. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. That, thanks, Louisa. Those sort of things I've been battling for 15 years. I have to say before. I know. <laughs> before I was an MP, I was, uh, 
they've shown them as Yorkshire Humber. So it's, yeah, very frustrating that some, I think it's getting better, but I think there is a lot of it. But, but let's hear from people on the on the front line. So, Cresta, how do you feel? Because you've got a, 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 a basically a, a manufacturing business and you're, a, you know, you, you, you know, you've, you work with big brands like Burberry, don't you? So you've got this, do they view you as just a nice bit of charity or as a real part of the supply chain and, you know, a proper business? I think it depends. It, it, it depends. Some days, you know, I've been in conversations with, you know, CEOs from some of the biggest luxury businesses. And there are certainly some of them that feel like what we do is, um, I mean, even the, the president of Chanel once said to me that, you know, what we did was basically a, a nice hobby. Um, and I then, you know, emailed him our previous three years of PL and explained that how interesting it was that our ROI was much better than his over the past three years. And maybe, maybe he was in la la land. We need people to be very specific about how buying social can transform, can transform the landscape because you're not getting less by buying with organ you're not buying maybe for a cheaper price by buying with a social enterprise but you're just getting insane amounts of value and i know that se uk has been making this argument for as long as i've been in the uk we need to we need to not be we need to not be in culture media and sport anymore we need to be under the agus of bays and we probably need a social enterprise czar who's pretty bullish and aggressive i've got our mp our my local mp is coming to visit us in a week and a half's time and this is the this is the case i'll be making is it is about is about buying social because we're losing value to the economy by not having it in basically every procurement document as the number one objective if there is a social enterprise supplier you should have to make an argument as to why you're not buying from that social enterprise supplier, not why you should be supporting that social enterprise supplier. We've got to completely change the landscape. We, used to, you know, right now you have a fair trade aisle at the supermarket. I think the whole supermarket should be unfair. All of the labeling should say unfair, unless you can prove that you're fair. The the that way we will. Ch that's the only way to change the the shopping habits. We we have to be a little bit more stick i think <laughs> we have to be a little hard hardcore now because the time is just so tight thanks this is the point about the apartments that is something g has taught um, i mean actually there, there is also a, it should be in treasury um but um did you know i had a dcms minister now social enterprise sits under nigel Hudson under about 20 other things he's never going to get social enterprise if we're honest that doesn't know anything. I like night night. Chat him on tourism and heritage, but he, he literally knows nothing about it. Um, and I'm not sure what what. If you're a social enterprise mid Worcestershire, invite Nigel Huddleston because he's the minister. Um, right in mid Worcestershire. Anyway, uh, on on that same question from Louisa Harry, what's your perspective? Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Louisa and Chris. Really, really good questions. Um, I feel one of the biggest. Uh, gaps in the current market is around providing the, the valuable support we need uh, to social enterprises as a whole. But when it comes to tackling specifically climate change and biodiversity crisis, there is a real lack of funding available, I think, for many environmental entrepreneurs. Whereas most entrepreneurs that come into this space, there are many funds available. Many of the social finance organisations, for example, don't even have uh, the environmental conservation even in their objectives. So I think especially to the UK with how far behind we are uh, in terms of nature depletion but also looking at our climate targets as well social enterprises can really help you know fill some of these gaps and can really help turn things around so there needs to be a new uh, initiative to support environmental entrepreneurs uh, the funding needs to be there but not only that but we also need the other support that entrepreneurs need coming up into this area so helping with connecting, and I think SEUK do a fantastic job in this, connecting with the private sector, um, but also many post-investment support that's really needed as well. And one of my worries around COP is that it's, it, it seems to be focused much on big industry, which is obviously where we, need, where we need to go to change that. But also there doesn't seem to be much attention on social enterprises that are working in the space. So that's what I would like to see over the next year is a lot more emphasis on supporting environmental entrepreneurs 
and helping them scale up so they can become fully sustainable and have that long standing impact, which I know all of the entrepreneurs in the space can have. And um, Pranav, have you got a perspective on this as well? Yeah, no, sure. Um, I think our sort of involvement has been around sort of the whole pushing the biosocial agenda. Uh, and we actually work very closely with uh, SEUK, um, especially Andy. Um, and I think he's just put in a note as well around sort of the biosocial corporate challenge initiative that they've got in play. And that's where we've sort of broken into the corporate supply chain, which is, uh, you know, to be honest, a mess uh, to sort of navigate. Uh, and we've luckily uh, done that through the support of SEUK. And there's a, there's a stat there as well. The 95% of corporate uh, partners say social enterprises are as good or better, you know, than other suppliers. And that's what we're really trying to push as well and prove through our own initiative across all the corporate partners and, and that we work with. Um, because, you know, we don't provide not just, it's not all about the price, it's all about the value as well, as Chris mentioned. So yeah, definitely um, there's scope for us to push uh, that forward. Great, great, thanks. Um, I've just noticed um, that Andy's got, but it looks more like a comment in the chat than a question. Is it? Is it? Is it just a comment, Andy? Andy Daly. Hi, sorry, I've been on the camera off all, all morning. Yeah, it, I, I'm I'm SUK working on the biosocial corporate yeah. challenge, as Pranav said, and every year we bring out a report based on what our social enterprise suppliers tell us and what our corporate uh, buyers tell us, and consistently our corporate partners. We've got 29 big businesses signed up now. They tell us, yeah, 95% of them say they're as good or better than their other suppliers on both cost and quality. I think I've got that stat right. I think one of them was 95%, one of them might have been 90%, but I'm going to say 95% on both. Um, and and Nemetes is a great example of, of, of that, you know, and I know Pranav, you've actually even brought out uh, a sort of more affordable range now to tailor to the B2B market, which I'm sure is going to go down really well. And then that, that messaging that you said earlier on about the ultrasound connecting the, the, the tag to the bag, I, I haven't heard you say that before. And that just makes me think, is there a better tea bag anywhere out there if you're interested in the environment something to think about Pranav is that the messaging <laughs> yeah no definitely <clears throat> great um so I, I don't want to slip too far behind time so I'm next going to um, introduce Paul Gerard from the cooperative group who I know is going to have a presence at COP uh, and Paul's also um, a director at COPS UK and I just say that I'm a cooperative party MP so I'm very directly involved with COPS in general and the COP group in particular so Paul it'd be great to hear a bit more about what you're doing your perspectives on COP26 from a COP group a COPS UK point of view. Thanks Alex and <clears throat> just to add to the list of things I do I'm also a trustee of the Cooperative House Trust which uh, runs the Toad Lane Museum in Rochdale um, if you'll let me Anyone in Manchester or Rochdale, please go along to the Toad Lane mu 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 Museum. It's a fantastic place to visit. And finally, I'm also a director of the Film Corp Foundation for Cooperative in Innovation. So I'm pretty deeply embedded in the cooperative movement. Um, I guess three thoughts. Some of it will, will repeat what um, colleagues have already said, but I'll just make them anyway. The, the first one point is about action, about action now. And I think social enterprises more generally, and certainly the cooperative movement particularly, has have got a role to play here uh, because actually it's very natural for cooperatives and social enterprises who are about adding value to communities not extracting profit from them to be to have that distinctive edge and i think there's something about the we're sometimes scale i think um harry uh, mentioned this scale can be a problem at times i understand that but, but with this with the scale that we have the agility to really connect into people and to um raise awareness around that i think is is an important one so i think there's something about understanding the need for action now second thing i think we all have a role to play um the court the court group is a big business it's a 11 billion pound a year business it's also by the way the single biggest supporter of fur trade and has been since it was established in 1992 while other supermarkets there are others app available apparently have decided to create um wooden spoon versions of fur trade we stuck with fur trade because it, it's a it's a far fur and more democratic it's the gold standard so um but big businesses have a role to play 
not just in the supply chains, and that is important, but they also have a role to play in using their brand, their platform, and their voice. I am always struck. Um, I've been in the court for six years now, having been 20 years in the civil service, that the court group punches above its weight in terms of its voice. Uh, people listen to the court group for lots of re re reasons, which perhaps they don't listen in the same way to bigger bigger supermarkets like Aldi or Little, etc. So I think there's something about using the platform and voices that we all have. Um, I also think there's something about uh, principle six of cooperation, which is corporate cooperation amongst cooperatives. There is something about building the scale of here. Yes, social enterprises account for, I think, 3% three, three, three of UK GDP, 60 odd billion pounds, uh, co the cooperatives are 30 odd billion pounds. But we're not awfully good, I think, at connecting together to give the voice, to bring our voice to, together and our action to, together. Um, we are at COP26. We've taken some pretty strong action. I'll come to this in a, in a minute. Um, I'm not convinced COP26 is going to get us an awful long way, in my own view. Uh, but in a sense, it, it, it can be the starting point rather than the destination point. And I think, I think that's the whole point about it. Um, two final thoughts. Alex, um, businesses of whatever size need to step up. I was very struck. There was a report last week that said 20% of FTSE 100 companies have got um, net zero science-based targets. If you look at the cooperative movement, 70% by value of, that, of the cooperative economy have got net zero targets. Okay, Cooperative businesses are stepping up in a way that non cooperative businesses aren't and I think we tell that story and we need to shame people. Uh, so I think businesses need to step up undoubtedly. I also think that government needs to step up and it's quite a tough challenge for you and others in the house at the minute, Alex, given the size of the majority on the other side, but actually government needs to step up here. So there are things that can help to force businesses to do different things. Mandatory reporting of scopes one, two and three, you know, you know, um, beginning to incentivise action. So, you know, we are, all our stores are carbon neutral. Uh, by 2025, our uh, whole operations will be carbon neutral and will be, and will be net zero by 2040. We've reduced emissions by a half since 20, 2006, sorry, by 70% since 2006. There's lots of these things, but actually you don't hear about, about them. And I think there is something about, well, I wouldn't quite go on the, Although I have some sympathy with the idea of a fair trade and unfair trade aisle. Uh, I quite like the idea. I'm not sure how workable that, that, that is. I do think there is something, though, about shaming businesses that don't do the right thing. And I don't think that is as tough, a, as tough an approach as it could be. But equally, I think we need to hear all the businesses that do do the right things. And, and, and I come back, back to that stat, which I think is a really powerful one. 70% of the cooperative economy have got net zero targets compared to 20% of the FTSE 100. That tells you something. And I'm just, you know, and I think there's something about both heroing organisations and sectors and perhaps getting a bloody big stick out for some of the, the others. Whether this government wants to do that, Alex, you will have a view that is more well-informed than me, given the, the arithmetic in the house. I'll sort of pause there. I'm happy to take questions um, as best I can, although I would um, agree that I'm not a, I'm not a, um, climate change expert, but I will do my best. That, thanks, Paul. I'm going to have to go in a minute because I have to go and give a guest lecture at Glasgow University. But I just want to say that um, we're now facing the politics. This has changed a little bit. So we did have climate deniers even in government, but now that those people and, and a much broader range of people are what we now call climate delayers. So they say it's happening, we need to do something, but it's too difficult. Um, maybe because the transition, you know, the fossil fuel transition, loss of jobs, the public mood isn't with, you know, them in terms of whatever it, whatever it is, whether it's the bank, federal diesel cars actually, which we're not doing too badly on, or or food waste, or whatever, whatever the issue is, um, and that's and that's slowing us down. So rather than us, well, it's more like we're walking through sludge, literally in, in some cases. Um, and so that's sort of where we are. Um, uh, I won't run about a change of government because that, that's far too obvious. Um, but, um, in the, uh, but I just want to say also about the COP group. I think, I think also, you know, before I hand over to, to Andrew, that, that, you know, FTSE 100, the COP group is uh, by um, in our sector, you know, 
of co-ops and social enterprises, 10 million pound turnover, and would easily fit within the FTSE 100. So it's really to ask for some questions because the scale of the co-op group means it does have an ability uh, beyond where, you know, you might reach your businesses, you know, million turnover or 5 million turnover, 10 million turnover. Is itself got a massive supply chain, is itself a big player, and it's quite different actually to, to the organization group because the opportunities are much broader and larger. So, on that note, I'll hand over to Andrew uh, and I'll have thanks very much for, for today. Thanks, uh, Alex, uh, for that. Um for that uh, closing comment there, I think, about, about the scale of the sector, and uh, good luck with your lecture as well. Um, I'm Andrew O'Brien, I'm, I'm Director of External Affairs Social Enterprise UK, and I think we're warming towards what was going to be the theme of what I wanted to say, really, which is that uh, I think that COP is obviously very important. It's very important that states take action, but I think it's also important to put some of this in context. The UK has just published this week its Net Zero Strategy, uh, about £650 billion pounds worth of investment, it says, is needed to help it to achieve its, its goals. £20 billion is coming roughly from the state. £630 billion is coming from business. That tells you where the power to deliver net zero really resides. It's not with states, um, to some extent. They are dependent on, given the way our, our economy is organised, businesses, as Paul said, particularly bigger businesses that have that strategic power within the economy, voluntarily investing, pushing the boundaries and developing and, and adapting their business models to deliver change. And I think that's the, you know, the elephant in the room that continues to go undiscussed, really. And we're running out of time to not discuss that. And I think that's where social enterprise comes into it, because effectively what we need businesses to act like is what they are, which is citizens of this society, of this planet, that have to sometimes make sacrifices in order to achieve a greater good. Um, you know, how many times have we were we told over the past 10 years, you know, we're all in this together, you know, we all need to pull together to achieve things. Well, business has a critical role. And of course, businesses themselves have been the primary beneficiaries of the fossil fuel economy. Um, of course, you know, we talk about countries, but it's the profits of business developed and where those profits have gone, often to richest in society that has really determined the way that our economy works and our economy operates um and to show you how perverse this currently this, this system is currently working i've been doing some digging and um you know i don't think paul or the co-op group are affected by this necessarily but um so if you take the committee on climate changes figures now they're more pessimistic than the government they think it's going to require 1.5 trillion pounds worth of investment to get to net zero not the 600 700 billion pounds which the government is talking about but their estimate is about 1.4 trillion pounds of that so the 90 percent of that's gonna to have to come from the private sector but there's a key point where they say that the only reason that companies will make these investments are if they are profitable so what effectively that means is, is that in terms of the behaviour, they're not saying that companies are going to do this because they think it's the right thing. They're not saying it's because they want to lead the way, etc. They're saying that the primary behavioural motivation for companies will be profit. Now, that sounds like a really banal point. But then when you start to think about the implications of that, what that means is that effectively, unless consumers or the state is prepared to subsidise and it's taxpayers, I guess, that pay for ta the state to operate anyway. So it's consumers, either as taxpayers or as, as buyers of products, which is where you look at it. Unless we're prepared to pay over the odds for that transition, unless we're prepared to pay additional profit on top of that transition, it's not going to happen. You know, companies are not going to invest in things they don't think they're going to make money from. And that's a real challenge, I think, for this. And I think that's why Alex Sobel quite rightly talked about climate delayers rather than climate deniers. And I think what you're seeing from the private sector is that classic collective action problem where they're all waiting probably for people like the co-op group, Paul and Elvis and Cressy and, and Harry and, 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 and others to kind of say, well, this is, you know, oh, can, can this be made to work? You know, what's the model that can enable us to extract value from this? Until that model is developed, we'll wait and see. We'll, 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 we'll stop 
we'll pause. Uh, we're not going to invest because we're not certain about what the returns what, what will be there. So we've got to try and find a way, I think, to, to try and adapt that economy, to adapt business. And I think there's two ways we can do that. One is through, as Paul quite rightly said, our voice and our leadership. You know, we can show the way and demonstrate that it doesn't have to be the old way of doing business. There can be a new way of doing business. Yes, with financial sustainability. I and mean, I think um, Cressy was absolutely right around this. You know, it's, you know, we're not saying that we're here to be subsidized. It's not a charity. It's not a luxury. It's not a hobby. It is business. It does require sustainability. And there is some profit involved in that. But the level of extraction, the level of profit, you don't have to, people aren't, don't have to be motivated and make decisions on the same scale that they were doing before COVID. Um, Second of all, I think we need to be pushing for that wider structural reform to the economy. Um, you know, we've had throughout our history moments where business has had to adapt and business had to change. You know, PLCs might feel like the natural way of doing business, but they weren't 70, 80 years ago. Go. You know, most of them were family businesses, privately owned businesses that weren't trading stocks and shares. Um, and to be honest, majority of still business is still in that. Uh, most businesses are not publicly traded companies. They are private businesses. But the, the strategic dominance of those largest companies is, has definitely shifted. Uh, and before that, we didn't even have companies. You know, people just develop partnerships. You know, people on the streets would come together on an ad hoc basis to develop you know, their products to invest in railways, to invest in trade, whatever it was they happened to be doing. So business is constantly adapted and constantly evolved. And the structure of that is a public conversation. Uh, you know, we recognize during the industrial revolution that we need a new models of business to capture and make the best of that new technology and to protect investors and to protect consumers. So we change business. And then after the Second World War, we changed business again. There was a new consensus around the need to have, you know, social security, social responsibility, not just the kind of hire and fire of the Great Depression era. And we changed the way that business worked again. If we're going to tackle COP, we need another revolution in the way that business operates. And I think that's exactly what social enterprises are articulating and demonstrating both through our own business models, but we also have a leadership role, as Paul said, to make our voices heard and to try and find a way around that. And that's not to be anti-business. It's not to say that business isn't the solution because it is the solution, but it's saying business as usual is not the solution. Something has to give. It's not going to be the planet. The planet's not going to change to fit the needs of business. Um, society's not going to change either. You know, we're not going to go back Back to or, or potentially I think there's a bit of naivety politically and in the business community that they think that people are going to tolerate high levels of taxation high levels of uh, you know consumer cost spend and the same level of profit being extracted to pay for the green transition that's just not politically sustainable um, you know we're starting to see that already with concerns about inflation and the cost of living so there's going to have to be you know the planet won't give society's not going to give so business is going to have to flex and adapt um, and it's going to have to be a more a new social, political, economic agreement around that. And I think social enterprise has a lot to offer there. And our business model has a lot to offer there. And all the examples we've heard here from METs to Bright Tide to Co-op Group to Elvis and Cressy are showing what can be done. But they need to be scaled. I think Cressy made that point really well. You know, we need to scale these things up and we can't just rely on the social enterprise sector's own organic growth. We need to be a, a wedge which drives change to that issue. So uh, really enjoyed this quite you know fascinating talk this morning and I think a lot of really great points there and a lot of great leaders in our sector that we can uh, that we can work to so um, are there any kind of final kind of questions or comments that people want to make I mean this is your platform as well it's not just for for me and Paul to pontificate on or, or, or others you know it's very much a collaboration um, has anyone got any final points they want to make or, or questions for Paul myself or, or Harry or any others Paul yeah you want to chip in um, go ahead thank you um I put it in a chat and we had some experience with this and we have experienced this over the last few years on tackling slavery in supply chains. Um, I think there's undoubtedly true that the PLC model means that many will not do this unless they absolutely have to, okay, because it will cost and it does cost, you know. Um, the truth is if you look, you know, if you look at all the things that we're doing and other businesses are doing as well, it costs money this, you know. Um, but if you're in it, we're, we're fortunate as a Cooperative, it's not an extractive business model, so we can plan for a long term. My only observation was that um, if corporate boards see climate as a risk, either a risk in the long term sustainability of their supply chains or a risk to their brand, if they see it as a risk, risk and audit committees in, in, in the corporate world, as you well, as you know, Andrew, and others were on the call, are very powerful 
parts of the governance of those organisations. And maybe they see it as a risk that they are seen as climate deniers, making the climate challenge worse, then they'll take action. It's entirely self-serving and that's fine because that's what the business model is. But actually one of the ways into this, I think, is through that risk management approach. So that actually, you know, you know, um, I'm pretty, it, it will be interesting to know whether, um, I forget which, which of the fast fashion chains it was, it, was it Boohoo in Leicester were there some really unpleasant um, uh, working practices in Leicester. You know, if there were suppliers now who were engaged in child labour, that would be a, a red risk on a government and they take action. And so I guess this is a long bit rambly, Andrew, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that one of the ways to put pressure, I think, is through that risk management approach. And that means making it, making it um, uncomfortable for a business not to be able to demonstrate beyond greenwash what it is doing. That's a really good point, Paul. I think that's definitely, definitely something here. And I think, you know, we've, we've had some experience with that, obviously, with the work that SUK has done on the Social Value Act, for example, to try and, you know, change the way that we measure and account for procurement in the public sector, but increasingly in the private sector as well, to try and get that up the corporate radar, I think. And, you know, I've got, I mean, I think anyone that thinks that we're designing a, a system for saints rather than sinners is on a hiding to nothing, right? I mean, you know, we, we and I think again with COP, we, we, there is a bit of naivety, I think, around this that, oh, you know, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zucker, but they all get this, right? They're all good people. I couldn't care less if they're good people. Most people just do what they, are told to do right you know you have a corporate structure i mean and you you or a company structure or sort of strategic goals and you meet those and you know we've seen it with facebook yesterday and the whistleblower i mean she doesn't sound like a bad person um she says her colleagues are not bad people but they have a structure and i think you're absolutely right paul we need to work within those structures and find ways to to change the the way that those structures work rather than um you know just calling people out and saying you know oh, they're bad people or you know climate deniers or whatever because i think we've kind of moved a bit beyond that um harry i mean you've got more experience probably on the corporate side and engaging on some of these issues what what kind of messages works i mean what what would help is paul right around the risk register side you know what can we do to get corporates to see this as their their responsibility and and to potentially even take a, a hit to their profitability but because it's the right thing to do and they have to do it. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. A uh, really good question. And I think it's it's really um, interesting to bring this up because we've also got the, the task force on nature financial disclosures coming up soon, where companies are going to have to uh, disclose in their annual reporting to their investors, but also to consumers, whether or not they are nature positive or not. So whether or not their operations and supply chains are harming nature. So I think there is a, there is a real... Um, a real push uh, around the the risk uh, points, which Paul May thinks is a really good point, because in the end, if companies are not going to be uh, taking these issues seriously, or if they're publicly committing to hitting these targets, but they're found out to be not taking them seriously at all, I think there's going to be huge financial risks for them, uh, reputational risks. There's a changing, as I mentioned, there's a whole changing workforce. There is Gen Z, you know, millennials who are going to make up 75% of the workforce by 2025. And, you know, the, the changing circumstances of the workforce have changed now where people, they want to work for companies that have a social purpose, that are ethical and are actually taking action. So I think there's two things which we can do as social entrepreneurs. Firstly is a educational process. I think part of the problem is that senior management teams, CEOs, they still don't really understand, you know, what nature is, what biodiversity is. It's still quite a new term that's been used. And you know, what are the risks involved in biodiversity loss? So I think there's a lot of work in, in working with senior management teams to get them to see, actually see the risks to their business if they don't take action from climate change. I think COVID has helped with that because you've seen businesses completely collapse in their supply chain. And then there's a part around employee, employee engagement. So whilst a company can have a net zero strategy for 2030 or 2050, if they're not working with their employees and in, in engaging them in that strategy or doing things around climate and the environment, again, they're going to be left behind and they're not going to be able to attract the staff they need and the talent they need in order to really evolve over the next decade. So there's a, a lot of work that we're doing is around employee engagement and education programs. Uh, so that's really fun ways to talk about climate change in the environment. We do like hackathons, workshops, talks, uh, get their staff involved, make them feel part of this. I think a lot of it is to do with purpose as well and well-being. 
So there's kind of two ways. There's the high level stuff with the senior management teams and the CEOs educating them about the risks and giving them options to uh, reduce those or mitigate those risks, whether that's supply chain or looking at projects to invest into like restoration projects or rewilding projects. And then secondly, a lot is around uh, employ educating their employees and engaging them to also feel part of the solution. So that's kind of the way we're, we're tackling the issue. And it's been great, you know, we work with some really big tech companies. We, we've got a current hackathon with a tech company called Yoti. Um, we've done some work with Vodafone, uh, Dell and others. And uh, this is kind of the, the, the program we're gonna be taking into next year. And, and then secondly, Andrew, just sorry, the, the next part as well, which I think we need to look at is how can we help better promote the uh, social enterprises that are working on climate change, like some of the, the speakers here today, how can we better promote what they're doing? Um, I think SEUK is probably the best organization for doing this, but how can we sort of elevate those to um, the investment community as well? So VC funders, um, and then there's, that's another important part of the parcel as well. I'm going to touch on that, Harry. You may, you, there's a good point, a couple of bits to that. One, I don't know if anybody watched it over the weekend, but there was a program on Channel 4. I must have been, I'm not a regular Channel 4 viewer, but I did interrupt my usual viewing for this. It was Joe Lysett's versus Shell, um, and he was basically wanted to develop an advert that told the truth about what Shell was doing. And I think not to kind of call out Shell necessarily as being the, the root of all evil, because I know all the oil and gas majors are pretty much the same, but you know, I think he was 10% of their investment goes into green energy. And I think 90% goes into traditional oil and gas. And in fact, they're bringing on new oil and gas fields currently, which, you know, is not saying they shouldn't happen because we, do, we still need oil and gas for the moment. But he tried to put an advert out to basically to call that out and to say, well, you know, all the adverts are about wind turbines, but actually 90% of what they do is oil and gas. And the Advertising Standards Agency banned him from producing an advert to do that. And they said that wasn't permissible. And I suppose coming back to your point, Harry, and, and to some extent, Paul, what you were saying, you know, it seems like social wash, green wash is very easy for companies to get away with currently. I mean, you talk about fair trade, Paul. I've noticed, I think co-ops the standout example of this, but I, I noticed a lot of other big brands are moving away from things like fair trade standards and, you know, using things like Rainforest Alliance and other badges and so on. I mean, I'm not an expert on certification. I don't know what the difference necessarily is between those. But as a consumer, it's getting harder and harder for me to know who's actually doing it. And to give one really practical example, which I often use for this and how the social enterprise sector needs to be careful. Uh, you know, everyone knows Baloo Water, which is a fantastic example, you know, using ethical glass, recyclable glass, giving all its profits to water aid. There is another water company, which I won't name, owned by some big European brand, which has produced its own bottle, glass bottle, which almost looks exactly the same as Baloo Water. It gives a portion not the whole, but a portion to be non-described to the consumer, to pump aid, which obviously is a very similar charity to water aid. Um, if you try and find out what proportion of that money is going to, to charity, you can't find it out. Um, and they basically tried to copy and steal that social enterprise brand. Now, if I was a consumer and I knew Baloo Water and I was just casually picking up another bottle of something, I'd go, oh, that's similar, isn't it? That's the same thing, I'll take that, even though we don't know what the social impact is. So, Paul Harry, I mean, you're the experts here, but, what about advertising and um, what about investors as well? I mean, I read a shocking statistic the other day that a third of low carbon funds are investing in oil and gas still. And part of the reason they're doing that is because they need a diversified portfolio, also partly because there's not enough companies to invest in. But people are putting their money into these ESG funds thinking they're doing environmentally good work. And they don't know what's happening with that money necessarily. I mean, some of it's still going to Shell and ExxonMobil and all that lot. So what do we do about that? Is that, am I just making that up? Is that a real problem or, and, and what can we do about it? I think, I think it, and all, and all the closing on the call might have a view. On the fair trade accreditation point, you know, I'd happily have this conversation with, with anybody who disagrees. Um, fair trade is the gold standard for a simple, simple reason. It's about ownership. Fair trade producers own part, own that business. If you look at some of the stuff others have done, same as Tesco, they are essentially dictating what happens. Fundamentally, ownership, empowerment, you know, that, that's why fair trade is the, is the gold standard. I think the advertising thing is an interesting one. Um, and I, I wouldn't have thought I would have proactively said this, but I will. We um, advertise on a range of channels and we have advertised previously on 
in the Daily Mail, and we will continue to do so where it makes sense for us. And lots of people will dis disagree with that, and I understand why I am far from being a Daily Mail reader. The point, though, is that in that advertising, we have run, and indeed we ran it over the summer on climate change, we went preview on slavery. We have run full page adverts that are not try, try, trying to sell the co ops pizza and beer deal, although it's a very good deal, blah, 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 either way. It's not trying to sell that. It just talks about a social issue. So um, two or three years ago, over the space of two years, we ran several adverts about slavery. Nothing to do with buying, you know, if you shop at the co-op, you help to end slavery. Nothing to do with that. Just about the reality of slavery. We've done some work over the summer, our advertising campaign over the summer was just about climate change. I come back to, Andrew, I think businesses that have the scale that can run national campaigns, uh, as as we do, and, you know, our budget, our marketing budget is tiny compared to Tesco or Morrison's or whoever. They have a responsibility, I think, or they have an opportunity, let's put it that, to show some leadership and to use some of that budget and funding and platform and visibility to talk about different things. Yes, you can talk about the things that allow that business to continue. And the co-op is a business. We're not a charity. We're a business and a commercial model but part of that commercial model is using our voice our platform and our assets including our marketing budget to talk about important things because i think you're right andrew i think there's something about calling out where actually we are uh, i'm not sure that's always done i mean what's i mean uh, from a from your perspective i mean do you think that we do need to, because I, I, I agree with everything you said, and I, I think there's there's a lot there's a lot we can work on around that. I just noticed. I, I mean, I'm sure co-op you pick up on this, but I feel like Tesco, Morrison's, and others during the pandemic kind of copied co-op quite a lot. I mean, I couldn't stop on the radio hearing them banging on about how they were community focused and, you know, oh, you know, we're giving money, not telling how much they're giving to charity, by the way, not like co-op. I mean, I, I shop at the co-op, as you'd expect, very regularly, and I go in there and it says, you know, how much is going to local community projects and I can see which ones it is. You know, I know Waitrose kind of does something a bit similar as well, but you know what from a corporate perspective how does that affect you as a business i mean uh, does it do you kind of double down and think right okay we've got to try harder we've got to push harder against this or can you see why it might be demoralizing for some companies because I, I can think why you know cop you've made such a strong brand about your social environmental impact and obviously you're sticking with it because your cooperative values but my worry is you know for other companies who think well we're going to make play of being the best social and environmental business or the best social enterprise but then another corporate can just come in and pretend that it is and they in the consumer can't see the difference you know why would you make the effort to do that so it, it, it how does that affect you as your business so, decision making so so, so first, first thing i would say is that you know i know lots of my opposite numbers in different businesses across our sectors and some of them do some fantastic stuff tesco for example actually their work with wwf is fantastic and, and they should be absolutely applauded for that uh, and others have done some, I think Morrison's during the pandemic, they, they did some fantastic things for really isolated, vulnerable people. So, you know, again, you know, this isn't about banging a PLC model because some of those businesses do some fantastic things, you know, absolutely. I think for us, um, we recognise commercially, one of our biggest strengths is the fact that people think of the cult as a business that tries to do the right thing. Right now, we don't always, we, we get things wrong, you know, because we, we are, you know, um, a, a set of human beings who try to make the right choices, but we try and do the right things. That for us is a competitive edge, right? That is for us a competitive edge and, the, and that can drive people towards us. It can bring people towards us rather than drive people away. And so for us, we, we have increasingly made great play of the fact the kind of business we are uh, because, because it suits our brand. If you're a different brand, what might suit it is you can get, you know, environmentally friendly products at a really good price. It might have your price thing that drives it. So I think it depends on the business. But for us, we've stuck to our guns. But I would say the reason for that is when you're member owned, we are not bound by big institutional shareholders saying you've got to pay out a dividend. You've got to do this. We can make those choices. There's other things that hamper us, financing uh, or absolutely but in that sense we can make better choices because we are member owned not driven by particular institutional shareholders who are looking for big payback and others on this call will 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 will, will have views on that that's just my view 
No, thanks, Paul. I think that, again, it all comes back to ownership, doesn't it, really? A lot of it does, um, and, and then what you can do. Joanna, you've been waiting patiently, and you're our resident cooperative expert um, at uh, SUK, so, uh, and a fair trade expert as well. So, um, Joanna. Yeah, so it's uh, largely uh, for me, I was just thinking in terms of the, um, the issue that we have around how do you help customers understand the difference between certifications. I've got quite a lot of experience at this. Um, from last year's Nestle campaign. So um, the important thing for me is people don't necessarily trust advertising. So that the idea that the corporates are putting out all these adverts and everybody's believing them. Um, one of the strengths of particularly the fair trade movement, and I, and I think in particular the co-op, the co-op's got loads and loads of member pioneers and they're within their communities and they're telling the stories and it's all about storytelling. So for me, it's about if you have a story to tell and it's a proper story, people will go along with it. So you think about the grassroots campaigners for, in fair trade towns. There's getting off of 600 fair trade towns up and up and down the country. And each of them has got people that are passionate about the stories and the people that fair trade has helped over the last 25 years. And social enterprise can do that because we've all got amazing stories. All of the social, all of the members of SC UK have got their own stories that they can be telling within their communities. And I think that's our role as SC UK is to help tell the story, help show why social enterprises are different. Um, and I think the, the, what we're trying to do with the eBay project and the, the customer um, empowerment and education, it's really important because people don't really have a sense beyond a very a sort of airy fairy idea of what a social enterprise is. So they'll see something like, you know, a packet of um, Andrex toilet roll and it gives 1p to charity. And they don't see the difference between a social enterprise that's giving 50 or 75 or 100% of its profits to charity. So that storytelling is really important because it's really hard for us to fight against the enormous marketing teams of, of huge uh, organisations. But if we can harness community activists and empower people to understand the difference and then go out and tell people what the difference is, I think that's that's where we, we need to position ourselves. Perfect. And I think, Joanna, that kind of nicely brings us to the end, I think, which is a kind of an optimistic message of people power and communities. And look, I mean, I, I, I always feel a sense of these conversations and in a sense everything that we need we already have i mean all the technologies we need to solve climate change we already have to some extent i mean we know we just need to scale them and implement them you know in terms of the desire that's out there and i think joanna and paul and harry and uh, and others have spoken about this you know that, that's that's already out there there's already commitment out there it's just about mobilizing and channeling that so it's you know there are still huge challenges but there's also you know, all the tools we need are there. So that's a positive, I think, that we can build on. And uh, hopefully um, we can see some action at COP. And if we don't, Paul, you know, we and, and, and the business community, we can come together and, and force it through. We don't need to wait for politicians uh, to do that. We can, you know, to some extent, the power is in the hands of the entrepreneurs on this call and around the country. So thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, apologies uh, that Alex had to leave partway through, but obviously, as you can appreciate, it's a very busy period with COP, and you know, for a lot of other MPs and others as well, there's just so much going on currently, but we'll keep engaging with the APPG. Uh, thank you all for giving up your time this afternoon, and um, we will be in touch, and this will continue to be a really important part of all our work, I think, for the rest of our lifetime. So, you know, this will not be the last conversation from SUK on climate, but um, thanks so much. Have a good day and um, keep up the fight. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks for Thanks being with everyone. us. Bye now.